Well, hi there. So in this video, we're going to be taking a look at monopolistic competition. And there's really actually an interesting kind of mix of some little bits of monopoly and some little bits of perfect competition. So let's get started. The first little section here really is just outlining some of the basic traits of monopolistic competition. And just as a quick reminder, this is things like grocery stores or clothing stores, restaurants, um, stores like Walmart or Target. Most of these companies operate in monopolistically competitive markets. And what we mean by that is markets where there's a lot of firms, but not so many that they're perfect. And so you will have, will have a, oh, boy, that's terrible, downward sloping demand. We'll say downward sloped demand because there's not as many firms as perfect. And so they're, they're going to have a separation, just like we saw with monopoly of marginal revenue from demand. In addition, they're going to have, because of that, some price setting ability. At the same time, they have very low barriers to entry. So there's some elements of it that are going to look like monopoly and then some elements that are going to behave more like perfect competition. Because of those very low barriers to entry, we'll find that in the long run, they don't earn any economic profit. Now, a couple of the things that these types of firms often engage in are product differentiation. And for these types of firms, what it often looks like is them trying to distinguish their particular firm or product from other firms that provide similar products. The idea here is they're trying to create kind of little, almost small market segments where they can kind of behave almost like a monopolist within their own little market segment. And also they're trying to avoid customers switching away from their firm. So they try to distinguish their product from other products by saying, you know, we'll give you brand loyalty rewards. Uh, maybe we'll give you some sort of amenities if you frequently shop with us. So you'll often see that with things like grocery stores or retail shops with, you know, frequent, um, frequent purchaser cards or things like that, because they're trying to keep you away from switching to different products. Now, when they're in the short run, they can earn economic profit. Like we said, they, they could, just like any other firm, but in the long run, they're actually going to earn zero economic profit. And we're going to explain why that is actually in just a moment after we draw the graphs. So let's get started with the graphs. Now, they're going to look awfully familiar, and we're going to draw each one of these three in kind of a base picture at first. And then we're going to put an average cost curve on there afterwards. So as we said, there's a downward sloping demand curve because this firm is seeing a fairly large chunk of the product of the market, excuse me. But in addition, what they've done through product differentiation is also caused them to have some of this downward sloping demand curve. So the few number of, of firms and the fact that they have this product differentiation is leading to this. Now, because there's a downward sloping demand curve, there's going to be a separated marginal revenue curve. And so Mr. is still going to be separated from DARP. The demand curve still tells us the price that people are willing and able to pay, but marginal revenue is going to fall faster than the demand curve. Their marginal cost curve is going to look just like all of the others that we've studied. And this one is actually going to be a supply curve. It's their willingness to produce a given unit. And they always produce, if they profit maximize, at the quantity where MR equals MC. And so they price up on the demand curve. And so far, if this is looking really familiar, that's because it is. It's identical to an artificial monopoly. It looks exactly the same. In fact, there's no way that you can actually tell just by looking at the picture whether it's monopolistically competitive or an artificial monopoly. Now let's redraw this base picture two more times, and then we're going to add an average cost curve. So again, we're going to draw a separated marginal revenue and demand curve, and then an upward sloping marginal cost curve. That's the supply curve. And then we're going to go down Q sub F, and this is the firm's supply curve. So that's what I'm kind of making that distinction there. Now you might be wondering, why are we not drawing the market? It's really because the firm is really what we're going to be analyzing in terms of monopolistic competition. So we're not terribly concerned about a market graph. And our last one, demand, and then again, separated marginal revenue and an upward sloping. Oh, that's kind of a wonky looking one. Boy, this pen is really, really messy, I tell you. Struggle is real when you're trying to find good pens, right? Okay, so we've already established then what this firm is going to have in terms of marginal revenue, the number of units that it'll produce, and the price. Now we're going to need an average cost curve to show the firm in profit. And this is going to be in the short run, right? This is in the short run. Now, in the long run, they're going to earn zero economic profit. That's going to be the picture of the middle. But then the bottom picture where they're earning a loss, this is also going to be a short run scenario. They won't earn loss and profit in the long run for reasons that we'll talk about in just a moment. Now to show them in a profit, we need an ATC that comes down 
hits a minimum at marginal cost and comes back up again. And again, just like with artificial monopoly, we go down from the price down to the ATC and over, and that's how we find our profit rectangle, just like that. Now, for this picture, when they're breaking even, price is going to be equal to the average total cost curve. So we're going to have our average total cost come down. The demand becomes a tangent line. Keep coming down, hit that minimum, and then come back up again. And the, for the last one, they're losing money, so our ATC needs to be a little bit higher. And that means then we're earning a loss, and the area of that loss we define going from the price up to the ATC and over. So again, this picture looks exactly the same as we would expect it to look in an artificial monopoly. Now let me talk a little bit in terms of this shift to the long run. Now, if there are, for example, restaurants that are earning an economic profit, maybe you have like, I don't know, 20 or so in a given area, and they're all earning an economic profit. What that indicates is that there's probably lots and lots of customers who are walking through the door. And so new firms will enter right? We have very low barriers to entry. So as new firms enter, this demand curve for an existing firm and the marginal revenue curve that goes along with it will actually decrease, just like we actually would expect to happen with Mr. Darp in perfect competition. As new firms enter in perfect competition, the supply curve increases in the market, which causes Mr. Darp to fall, the horizontal line, falling in perfect competition. That is a lower price. Well, in this case, the demand curve is still falling, but it's just decreasing. It's shifting down. And it's going to continue to decrease as the customers for this firm go to the new ones that have just opened up. And it's going to keep decreasing, and new firms will keep opening until that demand curve hits a tangent line to the average cost curve, at which point when price and ATC are equal, those two values, then firm entry will stop, and they're breaking even. We're in long-run equilibrium. The same process works in reverse from the loss. If they're firms that are losing money, some of the firms will exit the market. And the customers that were going to the firms that exited the market are now going to go to the firms that remain, which means that the demand actually for those individual firms, they're going to see more demand. And so this demand curve for a remaining firm would shift to the right until it's just a tangent line, just like this picture we would expect up here. Now, the last part that I want to talk about in terms of monopolistic competition is efficiency. And we've talked about really two different ways of thinking about efficiency. There's allocative efficiency and productive efficiency. And just as kind of a quick review, it sometimes it's helpful to have a little list right here. And so we're going to put that right here at the bottom, productive and allocative efficiency. And these are all different ways of kind of saying the same thing. If we're productive efficient, we're the quantity at minimum ATC. If we're productive efficient, we would say there's no excess capacity. We're going to talk about what that means in just a second. And we would also say that if we're productive efficient, we are on a PPC. So we're fully using our resources. And that's kind of the way to think about productive efficiency is that you're fully using the resources that you have, the capital and the labor resources that you have, your land. And so you would be producing at your minimum of average total cost. The other way to say that is that there's no excess capacity. And we can actually see that on these three graphs. Now here, QF, that's not at the minimum of ATC. It's a few units shy of it. Notice the minimum is right here, but the number of units we're making is actually a little bit less. Now, if we had drawn our ATC going right through MR equals MC, it would be at the minimum ATC and it would be productively efficient. But that's only in the short run, remember? And by the way, that would just be a coincidence. As you can see, we drew one in profit here and it has excess capacity. The definition of excess capacity is just the number of units between the QF value that they are producing and that minimum ATC. And you can see the excess capacity also exists in long run equilibrium. Here's QF, here's the minimum. So there's gonna be a few units that we could produce that would have lower average cost and that's the excess capacity. When they're losing money, they also have excess capacity. They could be here, that's the productive efficient quantity, but they're actually producing far fewer units. And you can actually see that if you go to stores like grocery stores, restaurants, retail shops, it's almost all the time. Restaurants are not gonna be 100% full, right? They're not fully using their resources. If you go to many big box stores like Target or Walmart, they'll often have cash registers that aren't being used. There's space that they aren't necessarily using. They're not necessarily inefficient, but they kind of are in a sense. They're not productively efficient. But why would that be? Why would you not produce the productive efficient point? 
because you profit maximize at a smaller quantity. There might be a few days a year where you use all of those shopping carts or all of those cash registers or all the tables in the restaurant. But realistically, your profit maximizing quantity is going to be less than that. Now, the second type of efficiency that we've talked about is allocative efficiency. We also call that socially optimal efficiency. And this is the point where the quantity at, you say, write that Q at, where the price equals the marginal cost. Now, price is sometimes hard for students, right? It may be hard to know, like, what is the price? So we also could say the quantity at supply equals demand because demand tells us the price and the marginal cost tells us the supply. Another way we say that sometimes is the quantity at demand equals marginal cost. All of these are the same thing. And it's referring to this point on the graph where marginal cost and demand intercept. And by the way, if we're allocative efficient, there's no dead weight loss. And so we would say all the transactions that are happening should be happening. And there is dead weight loss. It's the area here, right here. We'll kind of shade that in in a slightly different way. That is the dead weight loss for a monopolistic competition. And you can see it here as well on the, on the long run graph and when they're earning a profit. They're not producing that allocative efficient quantity where price equals marginal cost. Now, the reason why uh, we don't really mind it is because we kind of consider it the price of variety. We don't usually go in and tell restaurants, hey, you have a price ceiling on your latest lasagna meal. That's because if we introduced regulation into those markets, we would expect there to be way less variety and way less options. We like having different grocery stores that cater to different needs. We like having different types of restaurants and different types of clothing stores. And so we accept a little bit of deadweight loss in those markets as just essentially the price of having some choices. Another way to think about that is that if we don't produce the socially optimal quantity of pasta meals at the local Italian restaurants, it's really not going to hurt society all that much. Sure, we would be socially better off if we had the optimal quantity of lasagna, but ultimately it's not quite the same as saying the socially optimal quantity of water or electricity like we were talking about with regulating a natural monopoly. So hopefully this helps you in terms of talking through the ideas of productive and allocative efficiency and also learning a little bit about monopolistic competition. I'll see you next time.